While Anthony stated that he only shot one person, the others would say that he was responsible for killing everyone in that home. So then them niggas snitched on him, bro. Try to run up on me. Good luck, Charlie. We rack our Roll him up in the mall. He walk in the spot. I know life of the party. 1942, Casamigo, my body. Murphy Valentine will return after these messages. Valentine's Day. Give a little of yourself. Give a... What happens when a kiss gets kissed? On the 14th of February every year, a lot of people have been born into a tradition. A tradition that involves significant others and loved ones. You show your love with maybe a heartfelt card, some chocolates, an evening out to celebrate a romance between two people either engaged... This nigga voice is not it. This nigga voice is not it. It's not, it's not putting me in that mood. That scary mood. He's in a relationship or seeking the potential for one. And it's all in the name of St. Valentine. Or as the holiday is known, Valentine's Day. But the origins of Valentine's Day aren't the hallmark holiday that it's portrayed to be. Not even close. When the Romans celebrated Valentine's Day, the men would sacrifice animals, including dogs and goats. Then, the hides of those animals Appreciate that you, they Bruce. just killed were used to whip their women. Nothing romantic or beautiful about it. If you look deeper into the dark origins of Valentine's Day, you may think that nothing quite as dark could ever repeat itself again. But if you thought that, you'd be wrong. People often associate Valentine's Day and horrific moments with the Valentine's Day Massacre of 1929, where seven members of Chicago's North Side Gang were brutally executed. But we're here to discuss something that is much closer to home, an event equally heinous, and it took place in 1993. His voice is mid. <laughs> it don't turn you on. At a sixth floor apartment at 645 Prospect Avenue in the Mott Haven section Wait, of the Bronx. Wait, what the fuck? Wait, what the fuck? Yeah, what? We in the Bronx, nigga. In horrific moments with the Valentine's Day Massacre of 1929, where seven members of Chicago's North Side Gang were brutally executed. But we're here to discuss something that is much closer to home, an event equally heinous, and it took place in 1993 at a sixth floor apartment at 645 Prospect Avenue in the Mott Haven section of the Bronx. Good evening, I'm Harry Martin. Tonight, police are trying to She's crack the case right of here. a Bronx massacre where six people were found shot to death, execution style, in an apartment on Prospect Avenue. That it happened in the Mott Haven section of the Bronx off of East 151st Street. Kathy Wolf has been following the story and has details tonight from the 40th Precinct. Kathy? The discovery was made Fuck when another tenant precinct. in the building noticed the door was ajar. Three victims lived in the apartment. They are Julia Santana, Edwin Santiago, and Maria Santana. The other three are family yeah. friends, Miguel Rivera, Annette Medina, and Christopher Hernandez. People who knew them were overcome with the horror of it all. So was it a robbery? Was it a drug shooting at this point? We just don't know. Six people dead. And tonight, there's an arrest. The bloody massacre happened 10 days ago, Valentine's Day in the South Bronx. Six people shot down in cold blood. On today's episode of Evil Intentions, this is the story of the Bronx Valentine's Day Massacre. I thought, I thought we was about to learn the origins of Valentine's Day and he was a serial killer, whatever the fuck. I shoot a stay over there, that ass. Shoot as a bitch. And tell him to get out of my hood. Nah, man. What do you have on top of what? The oldest at 21 is said to be behind the massacre. Revenge is the motive that's going through this whole thing. Spanish niggas in the Bronx going crazy, bro. 645 Prospect Avenue. What the is fuck? Fat and white. Bronx Send us that man. The area back then, known for violent crimes, drug rivalries, and known to be a place where children Train are often number. forced to grow up faster than they should. A common way of life for those who grew up in New York City at a time where pretty much Facts. every borough had this happening. Facts. Still, families did their best to ignore the harsh realities of their surroundings. That's something that's still practiced today, as the city's crime has skyrocketed once again. Among those living in the South Bronx neighborhood was a woman by the name of Maria Santana, just 26 years old. She resided at 645 Prospect Avenue with her mother, Julia Santana, 49 years old, and her brother, Edwin Santiago, just 17. By 1993, the family yeah. had lived in that building for about eight years. Julia was born in Puerto Rico and came to New York Billy's City when she was just a small child. 
Her daughter Maria was described as a young, beautiful and driven young woman. At the time, she worked at a factory in the Bronx, her brother Edwin attending South Bronx High School. Maria came Man, from South Bronx High School, niggas, they basketball team suck, bro. From a good family, and if she cared about someone, she would do everything to help them out if they needed it. In 1991, Maria began getting to know and eventually dating a man by the name of Anthony Casillas, someone she fell for pretty quickly. Things moved fast. Maria was very much into Anthony, and everybody knew it. When Maria began dating Anthony, things between the two of them moved pretty quickly. He was pretty much living in her apartment. I think Maria's mother did the worst way. He made a good impression. I think it stopped. She would do everything for him, from doing his laundry to you. cook for him. Things were comfortable, and it seemed like Anthony had it very good. Maria had plans for the two of them. She was in love and even wanted to join in a marriage with him. But sometimes, things aren't as straightforward as they seem. According to those who knew Maria, she wanted to marry Casillas, but he didn't seem to share the same feelings. To others who were on the outside looking in, it seemed like Anthony was just using Maria. Anthony, 22 years old, who also went by the name Ding Ding, was well known in his Bronx neighborhood, normally running a drug gang near 161st Street in Tintin Ave. He'd been in and out of Oh my god, on Tintin, right there on Tintin, bro. Niggas, y'all. Y'all don't know about none of this shit, little niggas. Prison previously for drug charges. While in prison, Maria remained loyal to Anthony. She would often send him money for commissary. And if he needed to reach her, she was fine with him calling Collect, just so she could be in constant communication with him. But when he was released and regained his freedom, his interest in Maria began to fade. And he found himself attracted to Maria's friend, a woman by the Oh, that time when she was talking about marriage and he was they saying he was just using her, she was in the, he was locked up. Oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Stuff. Name of Lourdes Serrano, Does twenty-two years old. A former too. student of St. Alsom's, a Catholic school in the South Bronx. She was described by a former classmate as a straight A student who was nice to people. According to sources who knew all parties involved, Anthony and Lourdes began dating without Maria knowing. And when she found out about this secret romance, she cut ties with both Anthony and Lourdes. Okay. As time went on, Anthony and Lourdes would become even more serious, eventually having a child together and even getting married. But the animosity between former friends Maria and Lourdes only grew heavier over time. Oh, Lourdes and Maria was front. Yo, this is a mid story, bro. Chris, what the fuck did you send, nigga? By 1992, the two getting into arguments was a regular thing yeah, whenever they crossed paths. Some <laughs> said that Lourdes was seen as jealous and still viewed Maria as competition, holding animosity toward Maria due to her having been with Anthony first. Things had become so heated between the two young women that they'd run into each other on the Bronx yeah, street one day and the two would begin fighting. Lourdes had her and Anthony's son with her, but it didn't stop them from coming to blows. Yeah. In the middle of the melee, Maria's brother- like five minutes in. Brother Edwin, also said to be Lord's very first sweetheart, and also in the drug trade with Anthony, would get involved to defend his sister, slapping Lourdes, causing her to fall and drop her baby. Thankfully, the baby was okay. Nigga, but man, this mo oh, this is third ad. This is right down the block. This is right down the block. That, like, this is, feel me? I'm beating my shit to your stream game. Make sure you bust a nut. That shit laying right on the TV would be the catalyst Whoever for dark events him. soon to come. After August of 1992, Lourdes was visiting Anthony in prison when he noticed that she had a bruise on her face. She would go on to tell him How about- How times did this nigga go back to prison? The huge fight. I'm for ya. And how Maria's brother hit her. He was furious to say the least, but he would tell her to let it go because he would take care of it when he was released. The fact that someone could even think of putting their hands on someone close to him and the fact bro, that- what are you doing, bro? He really could I think he's just ruining the video for me. His voice is not up to par, like, for storytelling. He's just fat in the dark. thing about it, it was really starting to get to Anthony. And for right there in his cell, he would begin to plot his revenge. On January 6th of 1993, 1993. Lourdes took $3,500 and bailed Anthony Casillas out. Anthony was free again. And one of the first things he did was confront Maria about her fight with Lourdes and about Maria's brother putting his hands on her. He would visit her at the factory she worked at on 138th bitch. Street, and he wasn't happy. It'd been months since the ordeal, but his anger about the situation only grew stronger. During this argument, it was said black, that Anthony fired a shot Happy at Maria, no which black. missed. He would then scream, your brother is fucking dead. 
Over time, it was said that she would also receive death threats via phone calls and expressed to some people that she feared what Anthony may do to her. She stated that if anything ever happened to her, Anthony would be more than likely the person responsible. Damn. But just a few short weeks later, it would appear that Anthony had a change of heart. He would visit Maria and her brother Edwin at their home and surprisingly began to apologize for how he'd reacted to the news. Yeah, that's he didn't want any bad blood. And that's cap. That nigga heard the rumors on the street that he was about to <laughs> he about to wipe them niggas off the map. He had to make he had to make good on his promise, feel me? Of being discreet. So he was like, Yeah, let's just be cool, we friends. So if we do get whacked, it wasn't me. This was water under the bridge. But the truth was he wanted their guard down because his plan was still very much in motion. Maria's brother wasn't convinced at this sudden change of heart, and he would end up getting more locks installed on their apartment door, as if he knew that a home invasion from Anthony was inevitable. Ayo. Edwin couldn't have been more correct. Anthony would gather a few of his friends, and they would go on to carry out one of the worst mass murders that this city has oh, ever seen. Oh, they got caught. Anthony and four of his friends would arrange a meetup at a bodega located on 161st Street in Tintin. And while there, it was said that they'd begin to test their guns to make sure they were working. According to a police source, the idea was to go to Maria and Edwin's home and rob Edwin for money and drugs, since according to them, Edwin was involved in selling drugs as well. The friends that joined Anthony were 17-year-old Luis Ramos, Edgardo Rosado, just 18, Luis Romero, 19, and Elliot yeah, Lopez, I mean, also 19. Is, is out there, Lopez man. was a star athlete at Morris High School where he ran track. He was someone everyone in the neighborhood knew, even the drug dealers on all the corners. Him being a part of a plot like this seemed very off, but him and Anthony had a tight friendship, since Lopez's sister was a friend of Lourdes, Anthony's girlfriend. Elliot, who went by the nickname Tato, graduated Tato. high school and was accepted to Baruch College with plans of joining the army that fall in order to pay for his tuition. Niggas is track stars, college, uh, high school graduates going to college and shit, and they carrying out missions like this. That really be, that's really New York, bro. While Anthony was that's mainly really in the streets and had a rap sheet that was growing, at one time, even arrested for selling heroin, codenamed Hellraiser, to an undercover cop. Two people on two different niggas paths, so, but sometimes the influence L. of the direct, streets direct is hard L. to ignore. The two were very close, and while Elliot looked to be on a straightened path, in reality, he was on the fence, and he could go either direction when he reached his crossroad. And reached that crossroad, he did. A bro, did a nigga just stand outside this building just recorded for 40 minutes, bro? According to reports, Anthony and Elliot would drive to 645 Prospect Avenue, Maria's address. The other men who joined would go by foot. While Anthony waited in the car, the others would get to the lobby. Normally, there would have been a doorman on duty, but on this night, the doorman was two hours late. Of course, the door was. to the lobby could easily be open if pulled hard enough, so they easily made their way in. When they I mean, entered the, the fuck lobby, was the door, what the fuck was the doorman gonna do against six niggas with, with, with uh, poles anyway? I ain't even peeped that he don't, he didn't want to record it. He probably did as went to the shit. I ain't gonna lie, I respect the hustle and the effort, but my nigga. By complete chance, they'd run into Maria, her new boyfriend Miguel Rivera, twenty three. Christopher Hernandez, 15, and Annette Medina, 17. Medina they was really a friend who lived kids, in the same bro. building on the same floor. They really also a mother kids. to a baby girl. She had dreams of one day becoming a policewoman. Christopher Hernandez, an honor student and artist at IS-52, was returning from a party shortly after midnight and made a call to his family letting them know that he was on his way. He had forgotten his keys and was waiting in the lobby for his mother to let him in. He had recently taken an entry exam for the High School of Art and Design, but he never made it back home. Because when these men entered the building, he would cross paths with them. The four assailants, wearing masks, would force Annette, Maria, Christopher, and Miguel back into the elevator at gunpoint and back to Maria's apartment, where she was forced to open the door with her own keys, making the extra locks Edwin had installed useless. Damn. Once the men were inside, they would call for Maria's mother Julia and Maria's brother Edwin to show themselves. Then, they were all ordered to lie on the ground. Nah, they wasn't there to rob, nigga. This was execution. What the fuck? They would then begin- They wanted to catch body, body, body? In cutting the cords to the televisions and VCR and use them to tie everyone up. At this point, one of the men would open the door to the apartment and whistle, alerting Anthony that it was time for him to come in. Tensions ran just about as high as they could as Anthony and Edwin like would start you. to argue, they making really the situation like even more heated. Edwin would utter out words of anger as he told Anthony that someday he would get him back for this. 
but it was then that one of the men with Anthony found Edwin's gun in a bedroom, and within moments, Anthony would shoot Edwin in the back of his head with his own gun. As the others screamed in horror, they would soon suffer the same fate. Miguel Rivera, Edwin Santiago, Annette Medina, and Christopher Hernandez were all shot in the head and killed instantly. Julia Santana was shot once through the eye, and her daughter Maria was shot twice in the head. It still had her coat on as she held on to her apartment keys. While Anthony stated that he only shot one person, the others would say that he was responsible for killing everyone in that home. Neighbor so then them niggas snitched on him, bro. Nigga said, now nah, I only caught one body. So basically he told him himself. So they got caught. He told on himself that he, he killed one of them niggas. And then the rest of the niggas got caught and said, nah, he killed everybody. That's crazy. Yeah, I ain't gonna lie. This is probably the correct time to use the word crash out, bro. Like, what are you doing, bro? He really did the most. Neighbors in fear heard the shots and the sounds of the men running from the crime scene around 12.30 a.m. And of course, nobody wanted to get involved. And for good reason. Since all that was left behind was a bloodbath unlike this neighborhood had ever seen. The first call to police would come nine hours later when the bodies were discovered. That's because someone else in the building peeked through the open door and saw the unimaginable. When the bodies were found, Edwin Santiago and his mother Julia were holding hands. And even more heartbreaking, Annette Medina's own mother and several others in the building heard those shots. People had already stopped reporting shootings in the area because it had become so common. She had no idea her daughter was in that apartment being killed. In the days after the massacre, Anthony and Lourdes would stay at the home of Louis Romero on Westchester Ave, one of the assailants. They would spend two or three days there watching movies while nursing their sick child. Word of the massacre was all over the news, and authorities still didn't know who carried this out. Anthony would swear to Lourdes and her mother that he had nothing to do with the murders. They didn't believe him. Authorities would later catch up to where they were staying, and when they checked the room Anthony and Lourdes had been staying in, They'd find ammunition and a silencer that had been hidden in the back of a television. Anthony was brought in for questioning. They had some leads, but when it came to the investigation, authorities had no motive. The home wasn't ransacked, no forced entry. They found thousands of dollars in the home, so robbery wasn't why this took place. While authorities were stumped, Anthony and Lourdes would begin receiving death threats over the phone, cars, letting them know that they'd pay for what Anthony and the others did, a situation that went way past the point of no return and would only result in more tragedy and a shocking admission yeah, just 10 days much, later. Bro. On February 25th of 1993, Lourdes, Anthony, and a 17-year-old friend and godfather to their child, Luis Ramos, would visit the Bronx County building, where Anthony was to make an appearance on a previous unrelated drug charge. Lourdes pushed the stroller carrying their 10-month-old child. As she walked, she entered a narrow entryway, and unbeknownst to her, she was trailed by an unknown man wearing a camouflage jacket and a bulletproof vest, and he was armed with a 38 caliber semi-automatic handgun. That man would raise his gun and shoot a total of four times, yelling, they killed my friend, striking Lourdes in the neck once. The bullets weren't meant for her. Ramos, who accompanied them, jumped in front of the stroller doing his best to shield the baby and was also shot in the leg. Others were also shot in the crossfire but survived. Nigga cannot shoot. Wait, let me get this straight. Lourdes was shot in the neck. I don't think the baby was shot. The Lewis nigga was shot in the leg. And random civilians were shot. What the fuck? Ramos would survive his injuries as well. But Lourdes wasn't so lucky. Yeah. Bleeding out profusely. Later dying. I'm if what sure some witnesses caught. said is to be believed, it was said that Anthony used Lourdes as a human shield so that he wouldn't be shot. Oh, the shooter was 23-year-old Gilberto Ortiz of the Williamsbridge section of the Bronx, a friend of Edwin Santiago, who was killed in the massacre. He was there for revenge. Someone connected to Ortiz had their eyes on the fourth floor courtroom, where Anthony arrived for his appearance. Ortiz was alerted by Pager that Anthony was leaving the courtroom, leading to the events that day. He was caught soon after around the corner from the courthouse where he was chased and a court officer Dumbass shot him in his upper arm. There, he was taken to Harlem Dumbass Hospital and released to police later that night. Anthony. While Anthony was- like He was trying to complete that mission for real. Like, nigga caught a body, shot another nigga, and he still stayed around that motherfucker? Is this the same day? What the fuck? The suspect from the very start, as some leads pointed his direction, when the courthouse shooting took place, he was only being questioned about the shooting in the courthouse as seen as a victim. 
He was brought to the 40th precinct and police would continue to ask him questions. And in the middle of the interview, an officer would come in to inform Anthony that Lourdes was dead. It was here that Anthony Casillas, with one sentence, would implicate himself in the massacre that took place 10 days earlier, knowing full well that this courthouse shooting was retaliation. There was some confusion when it came to whether or not he was read his rights before he made his admission. What did he say? But according to authorities, he, said it was retaliation. he did admit to murdering Edwin Santiago. He would also give a two-page detailed written confession, but this was him minimizing his role in the murders, according to court documents. This dumbass didn't even have to say anything, bro. Just two hours before the courthouse killing, but he was so Elliot Lopez was arrested in connection with the Valentine's Day murders, and one by one, all involved would be held accountable. In 1994, Luis Ramos was sentenced to 52 years to life in prison, Edgardo Rosado, 15 to life, Elliot Lopez, 30 to life, Luis Romero, 15, 15 to life, life. Is not that bad. Gilberto Ortiz, who stated he feared for his life since Casillas killed his friends, stated he never meant to kill Lourdes. Anthony was his target. He was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison, and Anthony Casillas was sentenced to 162 years nah, to life in prison. Got 162 count. <laughs> They said, nah, bro, you, you're not making it out of here. Never will. For masterminding the massacre. Those events that took place in February of 1993 will leave a huge gap in the Bronx neighborhood and numerous families torn apart forever. Actions I'm sure nobody ever expected to escalate in such a horrific manner. A story that began with attraction, Damn, love, bro. and the possibility of creating a family like, when an entire- Niggas wasn't even gangbanging, bro. Niggas wasn't even like beef. Like, this is wild, bro. Entirely different direction because tensions ran high during a somewhat trivial love quarrel between three people. Whether it be betrayal, a love triangle, or ongoing disputes about what goes on in the streets, it's hard to imagine this not being preventable. Many families were affected by this tragedy on every side, and the grief and sorrow of what took place exactly 30 years ago is still a feeling these families carry with them today. Whether it be a year, 10, or 30, a loss so heavy, carried out so callously, is an unnatural emotion to process. Who knows exactly how to get through something like this? They say time heals all wounds, but how much time is that? Valentine's Day, a tradition that involves significant others and loved ones, but to those from New York City familiar with this horrific tale, this day is cemented into New York City's dark history, a day where love was to be the answer to all. But in this Bronx neighborhood ridden with crime, it was anything but that. A lawsuit was filed against the management of 645 Man, Prospect. this is tough, bro. This is dead tough. This is a horrible story. The video would have been 100 out of 100 if this nigga voice is better. It wasn't scaring us of him popping out in the dark. But other than that, this shit was aight, bro. Avenue, because the families of those whose lives were taken strongly felt that if a doorman had been on duty that day, or had the proper surveillance, these men wouldn't have carried out the crime. In December of 2002, the Bronx landlord of the property was ordered to pay $6.4 million to the families Word? as they what? found that they were indeed partially responsible for the massacre. All because you can open the Today's door, story right? isn't to reopen old wounds or cause grief for any of the families, but and to keep them- the landlord had to pay 16.4 mil because the fucking door was open. Like you could just pop that bitch open. Doorman wasn't doing shit, I'm sorry. But even if the doorman was there, what was he going to do? Everyone knows you could just pop that bitch open. That's like every New York City apartment. Like, and then what? The doorman's there and then all these niggas with guns pull out. Like, what the fuck? That nigga would have died too. The memories of these innocent people alive. And to give a raw glimpse at how fast things can get out of hand like when you're blinded by rage. It been him too? There's always another way. And those who lost their lives in this tragic event should still be here today. Rest in peace to all the lives taken that night. You aren't forgotten, and my deepest condolences comments? go out to their loved ones. Oh shit, chat! Look the comments. Annette Medina Nanny is my little sister, and I think about her every day. Thank you for telling the true story. Although I don't remember the victims being tied up as you suggested, you did a great job in your investigation. It's greatly appreciated. Nanny didn't want to be a police officer, and she would have been comments. My grandma, mother, dead hair, all the shots fired. My mother did hear all the shots fired and the people running from the scene. She never imagined that Nanny would have succumbed to the shots she heard on the case. She thought Nanny was in her room sleeping. Also, the, damn, bro. <sighs> Imagine it being so normal that your fuck inside your building is getting shot up. That's really the, how the Bronx was, bro. And niggas think this shit's sweet.
Make sure he left a red nose on top of the couch to show his wife that massacre was her Valentine's Day gift. Wow. Christopher was a classmate of mine. This made me cry when all we heard the news. It was surreal. His artwork was beautiful, just like his soul was. R.I.P. Damn. Fine ass. Damn, bro, that's tough. Is it still like that now? Yeah. Kind of. That's fucked up. They got niggas relatives in the comments, bro. Niggas relatives in the comments, bro. That's damn. Nah, Nick. What the fuck? The goddamn shit is evil intentions. You said New York. No, New York's off now. You never been in New York a day in your life, nigga. Tell me blessings on one hand, but I'm grateful. When I make it home, look to the sky and I say thank you. I peeked the snakes up in the grass. I couldn't play cool. If they put the up and leave, nigga, they was mental. 